we have uh, uh, to present his paper, Dr. Professor Jeremy Horder from the LSE, who's a former law commissioner of England and Wales, Professor Peter Aldridge of Queen Mary University of London, who's currently the president of the Society of Legal Studies amongst his many other accomplishments, and the current law commissioner for England and Wales, Professor David Ormerod from the UCL. So I'm not going to say very much more because I'm sure you want to hear what they have to say. So without further ado, Jeremy. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Mark. Uh, it's, it, uh, and I, can I just share the sentiments expressed by Julian at the beginning of his talk? It's a tremendous honour and privilege to be asked to give this seminar. These are a very special and unique set of seminars, and I'm very grateful to the organisers indeed for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, now, uh, I, I, I'm also very conscious that uh, as time marches on, attention spans um, are somewhat reduced, perhaps. Uh, so for that reason, um, because I personally find it impossible to concentrate on anything for more than about 20 seconds, unless I've got something to look at, uh, I did actually put together a brief PowerPoint before I came along to, uh, uh, to, to try to guide me in my, in my remarks, which will, uh, I, I think, be relatively few, but hopefully to the point. Uh, now, when I, I, uh, as some of you may know, and in fact Mark mentioned it just now, I, I was David's predecessor at the Law Commission in the, in the criminal law seat. And when I, I, I had two interviews, actually, to get that particular post, and uh, one was with a big committee and the other one was with the Lord Chancellor. Um, and at the committee, somebody said, well, why should we appoint you to be a Law Commissioner? You, spend, you seem to spend most of your academic time um, in intemperate terms criticising most of the Law Commission's papers. Um, so I said, well, I mean, that makes me the perfect person to appoint because I can just put right what everything that's gone wrong in the past, or words to that effect. Um, but of course now, and, and of course while I was in David's seat, I um, uh, vigorously defended absolutely to the uttermost any paper issued by the Law Commission while I was there. Um, but now, of course, I have an opportunity to revert to type and, uh, and, and spend my time uh, so irresponsibly um, uh, criticising the, the Law Commission papers, which is precisely what I intend to do. Um, and of course, the other, the other privilege you have as a scholar is that you can pick and choose exactly what you want to focus on uh, uh, without having the carrying the heavy burden of responsibility um, that David has to make the reform uh, comprehensive and uh, uh, to make it appeal to all comers. Uh, so I don't have to worry about what public office means. I don't have to worry about um, uh, what difficulties it may cause for the police or how much the reform will cost or any of those other things I used to have to worry about, and he does too. Uh, no, that's the glorious irresponsibility of being a scholar, isn't it? Um, so I, uh, I and, and in a book I'm doing for Oxford University Press, uh, I am focusing on reform of the misconduct offence as it applies to members of Parliament, um, who, of course, it would be nice to think are in all matters and at all times upstanding uh, and uh, uh, people of great integrity uh, 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 doing their job on behalf of us in the best way that they possibly can. But, of course, we all know that's rubbish. And so the question really is, um, to what extent should the criminal law uh, be uh, 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 applied to them? And to what extent, actually, should the misconduct offence be reformed in such a way that it has a more pertinent application, I would say, uh, to the uh, uh, to MPs and their in their various activities. Now, I'm not going to go through all the various things: election fraud, misspending, expenses, sex scandals. I mean, there's all, any number of things I could focus on. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, overview, really, uh, about the way in which the law reform bit of it works, um, uh, uh, since we have David here, and. Um, I'm going to start uh, uh, with what I think. Um, and you, you have up, up there uh, two offences uh, which I suggest it might be helpful to reform uh, it, it, in terms of reform of the law. Now, one is actually just a sort of reheating, really, of the current offence, um, uh, offence A, uh, willful neglect or misconduct amounting to an abuse of a public position. So there's no, no real change there, um, although I'll say something more about it in a minute. Um, the, the second offence, offence B, uh, is a bit different, actually, because it, it has an institutional dimension to it. And, and the language there will be familiar to anyone who has um, a, 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 even a nodding acquaintance with the corporate manslaughter legislation. But that, the wording, in, in a sense, is just a placeholder for the idea that one needs some kind of organisational offence. Um, and I believe that to be true because I think that the current misconduct offence has been very much underused. Uh, in relation to organisational activity, if I could put it in that broad sense. It's virtually never used against um, organisations, still less against political parties or other groupings um, in respect of uh, 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 willful neglect or misconduct that they've engaged in in relation to members of those organisations, if I could put it in that loose way. And I'll give an example in a minute. Um, 
So in broad terms, I, I would divide the offence in, into two in that way. But as I say, that's the, the wonder of being a scholar. You can make up these, dream up these suggestions without having to worry about what other people think. Um, now, um, offence A, uh, the, the, the sort of general offence. Now, one thing I will say is that um, uh, I, I, said, I, I say in the outline it should be punishable by um, uh, anything down as far as an administrative penalty. Now, why is that? Um, well, one of the things that I, I'm troubled by in the Law Commission's proposal, although I, I entirely accept that this reflects the position in the common law world as a whole, it, I, I, I quibble with the suggestion that the misconduct offence should be uh, confined only to serious wrongdoing. Um, and I, I, I quibble at that because uh, it seems to me that's creating a kind of de minimis principle for uh, public officials that does not apply in relation to any other offence, to any other offender in any other context. Um, and in particular, it seems to me, there is a very stark contrast between the Law Commission's proposal in that respect for reform of misconduct and the reform of uh, the law of bribery. Uh, I mean, modesty forbids me for mentioning who might have been responsible for that particular report. But nonetheless, in that report, um, no exception is made for uh, small bribes. And indeed, there's a good reason for that, because small bribes are well known and empirically demonstrated to be corrosive of public standards. Um, and I would say the same thing is true of um, willful abuse of office. Uh, where willful abuse takes place, it should be subject to the criminal law, and there should be no de minimis, de minimis principle. The Star Chamber used to deal with this, uh, you may be interested to hear, uh, centuries ago, by placing the relevant official backwards on uh, a donkey and riding him through the streets. Uh, that was the way in which they, did, um, uh, they, they dealt with small or minor instances of misconduct. Uh, but in the interest of improving our treatment of animals, I suggest that administrative penalties may be more appropriate in the modern era, um, although I, uh, I guess that might be open to discussion on that particular point. Um, uh, but um, I do suggest that there should be a focus on abuse of power. And in, in the book, I give um, all sorts of theoretical reasons for that to do with Republican theory of criminal law and so on. Now, um, but uh, let, let me not concentrate too much on that at the moment. Now, um, as I said a moment ago, offence B is meant to capture the important possibility of applying it to public organisations. Um, and it takes the corporate manslaughter offence as its model. Now, here's an example. It's been doing the rounds on the internet, so probably you've seen this already, I would imagine. But it's worth um, just raising um, as an example of the sort of thing I have in mind. Um, now, here we have a, a passage from a former uh, Conservative Party whip, now deceased, so I can say whatever I like about him. Uh, and he's um, quoted here in a BBC interview, and he says um, uh, about members of his own party while he was a whip, uh, anyone with it who was in trouble would come to the whips and tell them the truth and say, now, I'm in a jam, can you help? It might be debt, it might be a scandal involving small boys or any kind of scandal in which uh, um, a member seemed likely to be mixed up in, dot, 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 dot. Um, and it's one of the reasons, he says at the end there, because if we could get a chap out of trouble, then we'll do as we ask forever more. Well, I mean, I, I hate to be sort of you know, pernickety, but that, of course, is, is bribery, straightforwardly, it seems to me. And it's also misconduct in a public office. Um, but, of course, there, um, you know, there's a snowball chance in hell of anyone being prosecuted for misconduct or for bribery. Why? Well, because politicians are regarded as uh, sort of basically exempt from the application of these criminal offences, by and large, in relation to this kind of activity. Um, sorry, if I seem to be getting um, warming to my theme, uh, I actually gave a version of this paper, people may, people may recall, uh, at 9am on a Wednesday morning at the Society of Legal Scholars. And when the question time came up, um, asked was the first, que the first person said, well, I'm really impressed that you can raise that much moral indignation at this time in the morning, um, which, uh, went, which was true. But, I, uh, but I, I freely admit that the, uh, the, the expense scandal in 2009 was, in fact, the motivation for writing this book. I'm not, I don't, it wasn't a purely scholarly... Uh, uh, matter, but still, there we are. So, but I will try to rein myself in. Um, and actually, in the book, one of the suggestions I make is that political parties could actually be the focus of prosecutions. Um, and indeed, uh, I make the case, uh, uh, speculative though it might be in some respects, that um, the uh, elected members of parliament on in particular parties themselves constitute an unincorporated association, uh, which could itself be the subject matter of a criminal prosecution. They have uh, they have treasurers, they have secretaries, they hold funds, uh, they meet the criteria for unincorporated associations, at least in part. But I, I won't dwell on that somewhat arcane point now. Um, now, um, uh, as I say, willful neglect, the offence A, as I, as I put it, um, is focused on willful, willful neglect. And that's by and large a reenactment of the current law. 
And one of the criticisms of the current law is, of course, that it is vague. Um, I mean, that's a point the Law Commission makes, and they're not alone in that. Um, uh, but I, I counter that actually vagueness in an offence is, is a serious worry where you're talking about its application to ordinary citizens um, in their everyday life. Uh, but I suggest it's less of a concern where you are concerned with its uh, application to a body of public officials who are governed by a code of conduct which sets out uh, the expectations, the do's and don'ts, uh, and so on, and that that kind of soft guidance on conduct is important to in our assessment of whether or not a criminal offence complies with the rule of law. It is not just what is concerned in the wording of an offence that should concern us from the point of view of the rule of law, that we should take account of what is available in terms of guidance uh, um, binding uh, the, the subject group, uh, the group that is subject to the criminal offence. And so I make, I make the case that um, uh, just as, for example, you might say, the gross negligence manslaughter offence is not too vague so far as doctors are concerned because there's very clear guidance on what they should be doing in the, in the operating theatre and outside. Uh, even more so is it the case with public officials that they have codes of conduct guiding them. And, and in the book, I uh, boringly go through quite a number of these. Um, they're quite interesting documents, actually. I mean, if you think about it, a code, of a code of conduct governing public officials is actually part of our written constitution in a certain sort of a way. Uh, it, it is meant to be our guarantee that public officials will behave in an ethical manner. And what you find is actually most of these codes of conduct adopted by police authorities, by local authorities, and so on, are all taken from the same blueprint. Uh, so effectively, there is one uh, code which governs them all in effect, although it's not in fact, um, it wasn't meant to be set up in that way, but it is in fact. Um, so there is, I argue, perfectly clear guidance on that point. Um, and I also say, although it's a bit more adventurous, I suppose, but I, I also say that some degree of vagueness, if you want to use that term, uh, is actually constitutionally uh, appropriate because it allows the courts, it gives the courts the final say, if you will, on um, when uh, new forms of misconduct emerge at the highest level, particularly, but not only there, uh, in the public sector. It enables them, uh, within the limits of reasonable foreseeability and the criteria that have been set down uh, by the courts for the application of offences to new situations, I mean, within those guidelines, it does give them that constitutional ability to extend the law, and I regard that as an important freedom, personally. Um, so let me uh, now turn my attention then to the Law Commission's definition. And really, um, uh, I would say this is an argument between two bald men over a comb, but I can't say that because David's got a full head of hair and I haven't. Uh, but um, uh, but I, I, I say that because actually um, I, 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 I think the Law Commission's definitions are, uh, would be an improvement in the law. There's no question about that. I don't, um, the two offence structure that they set out makes perfect sense to me. Uh, it's just that I have a slightly different vision about how it should work, and I, I'm going to point out one or two uh, areas where I think uh, perhaps some further thought could be given. That's really all I'm going to do. So I'm not, it's not the kind of swinging attack that in my, um, in my sort of enthusiastic youth I used to launch against law commission proposals. Um, so I'm going to focus on the corruption offence uh, mainly, because that's the one that interests me. Um, and in the, uh, in the paper, the consultation paper, as you may know, the offence is committed when the defendant, as it says there, exercises a position, power, or authority for the purpose of achieving a benefit for him or herself um, or a benefit or detriment for someone else. And uh, Dee's purpose was seriously improper. Well, I've addressed the point about whether you should confine it to cases only of serious impropriety. So I, I, won't, I won't say any more about that particularly. Um, uh, now, um, one of the, uh, I make a kind of little jurisprudential point there that... Um, where you are trying to secure greater certainty through statutory wording, one inevitable consequence of that is that you will create gaps. I mean, that is what happens. Um, as John Gardner pithily puts it, um, thanks to the positivity of law, he says. That is the consequence. Uh, and indeed, that's what happens. And I'm going to mention three instances, I think, of possible gaps. Although David's already pointed out that one of them may not be a gap. But nonetheless, uh, let's um, stay with it for the moment. Um, one is the issue of influence, one's the issue of benefiting another, and one's the confinement of the fault element to purpose. Although the Law Commission anticipates that as a restrictive criterion, but I'm not, I'm not altogether convinced that it should. Okay, let's have a look. So here I have an example. Uh, a civil servant knows that a leading UK business is thinking of moving um, uh, the business to uh, mainland Europe. Um, and uh, the, the civil servant writes to the managing director saying the present prime minister is known to be minded to recommend knighthoods uh, to, sorry, I should say, two industry leaders uh, who remain loyal to the UK. Now, um, uh, 
Is there an intention on the defendant's part to benefit the managing director? Uh, I say no, there isn't. Uh, but there is an intention to influence the managing director in an improper way, I say, in that example. Or at the very least, if there's any ambiguity over that point, it ought to be cleared up by uh, including influence alongside benefit as a kind of improper uh, thing that you ought to that you can try to do. Now, of course, influence can be beneficial. Uh, so you might say some kinds of influence come under the conduct of benefit. But I'm not. I, I'd need to think a bit more about that point. Um, I mean, I'm not sure all influence necessarily is beneficial, but let's. Uh, it might be intended to be, but uh, I don't know. But uh, anyway, we, we will see. Uh, but nonetheless, I I, um, I think that that is a, a point worth thinking about. Secondly, maybe a bit more substantive. There's the criterion of benefiting another. Um, now, uh, in one way, of course, to make it a criminal offence for a public servant to benefit another person looks perverse, doesn't it? Because uh, the whole point of being in public office is to benefit other people, or so I'd assumed until I started looking into the conduct of MPs. Uh, but um, uh, so, that, I mean, there's something slightly odd about phrasing the offence in this way in an unvarnished manner, uh, it seems to me. Um, so what I suggest, uh, cumbersome though it may be, is that uh, there needs to be a further specification of who are the categories of other person that, it, um, that one should not be seeking to benefit. And there are plenty of statutory examples of this, um, the Financial, Act the financial um, Action Task Force, and in fact, in, in, indeed, under the, uh, under the expenses rules, there's a whole list of um, uh, people who are regarded as uh, persons one should not benefit. Um, so that there, is plenty of, um, there are plenty of statutory examples that could have been used uh, in, for example, a set of guidelines on who falls within the prohibited categories. And I, I suggest that that would actually be quite a good idea. Um, uh, now, there's actually a, the, the, one of the weak parts of the longer paper, which I need to brush up a bit, actually, is looking beyond that to who else ought to come within the prohibited category. Um, and um, it seems to me that actually the guiding light is really when you're benefiting another person as a public servant, are you acting solely uh, in the public interest? Or is there some element of... Uh, 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 of um, private or partiality uh, in your motivation, that that's really the key. Um, but I do need to think a little bit more about that. It's a weaker part of the paper. Um, then finally, um, there's the restriction of the offence to purpose. Now, uh, that is uh, you, uh, going, if you've lost the thread already, and I wouldn't blame you if you had, uh, un under the Law Commission's proposals, um, there is uh, a restriction of the offence only to those whose, ac whose action has as its purpose uh, benefiting in another. So the Law Commission um, avoids the use of the term intention because they don't want courts to slip back into cases where um, there may merely be foresight of virtual certainty that someone will benefit. So the, the use of purpose is, um, is quite deliberate there. Um, so, um, and I, I, I'm troubled by this because, um, uh, uh, and, and I ask myself why, why the restriction has been made in that way. Now, what, what one focus that uh, interests me and is also of concern for the Law Commission concerns um, wrongful conduct by public officials in relation to a conflict of interest. Um, I mean, that is a very important um, area of, um, uh, of public officialdom uh, that needs closely watching. Um, now, uh, the Law Commission says, I mean, quite rightly, that merely having a conflict of interest um, is not in itself anything wrong. Um, and that's right, we don't live in a so-called um, Republican, in the political sense, state where you can't, you're meant to purely act out of, um, uh, uh, you're meant to shed all uh, possible uh, sources of conflict of interest when you enter politics and so on. Uh, I mean, that doesn't happen. You're allowed to carry with you into politics and other areas certain kinds of conflict of interest. It's what you do with it uh, and what happens to it afterwards that's the focus. Um, so um, here then, uh, uh, what the Law Commission says, and that's absolutely right, is that unless the defendant engages in further wrongful conduct as a result of a conflict of interest, there's no reason for the criminal law to intervene. And that surely must be right. Um, but it didn't seem to me to follow, actually, that um, confining the offence to purposive wrongdoing uh, is the right way to confine um, uh, the scope of the criminal offence. And I give two, two examples which I think are, are, are an important test case. I mean, they could be applicable to any public official, but as I said before, my interest is in members of Parliament. Um, so, um, and, and both of them involve the use. Uh, both of them involve uh, dishonesty. And one, as you can see there, is a dishonest breach of the ministerial code or the MP's code, um, or at least certain key aspects of that code. Um, 
such as the bits that concern a conflict of interest. That, it seems to me, uh, passes the threshold, threshold for criminalisation easily, in my view, but would not be captured um, by the Law Commission's reformed offence. It is, of course, at least in theory anyway, uh, uh, captured by the current offence, but as we all know, that offence is never used against politicians in this country. Um, other offences maybe, but not the misconduct one. For some reason, don't know what it is. Um, pusillanimous prosecutors, I guess. Um, then the second one, although it's really just a kind of outcropping of the first one, uh, is dishonestly making a false or misleading statement in relation to a conflict of interest. Um, and that seems to me to be, again, something that crosses the threshold uh, of justifying criminal liability, irrespective of whether that false or misleading statement is intended by the maker of the statement to involve, um, uh, 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 intended to make a gain, uh, or has as its purpose the making of a gain. It, it seems to me that, that it's sufficiently wrong in itself, actually, to justify criminalisation. Um, so um, uh, I, uh, I, and I think, so I, I, I think that there is scope, or could have been scope, actually, to go beyond uh, uh, purposive wrongdoing in the Law Commission's paper, and that, it's t it, and that courts uh, and prosecutors will find it too constraining, actually, if it is confined in the way that the Law Commission currently proposes to define it. Um, well, um, I've got an extra five minutes, but I don't propose to fill it. So um, uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. And I, um, I, I wait with um, but, uh, uh, anticipation to see what David and Peter have to say about my paper. Well, thank you very much.